Cool. And we are live. We got someone actually already commented on YouTube who is Galad. Galad, uh, welcome. Thanks for Hello. being here. So like conversation or like time killer. Do you, <laughs> so I always want to, I, I should prep people for this. And you, the answer can be no. Do you have any like very opinionated stances for developers? Like, are you a diehard one language or framework versus another? I feel like those are always like fun topics to to explore. Okay, so I can say no, right? <laughs> you can you can say whatever you want. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, I think use Git. Um, dark fair themes enough. for your ID. Dark Otherwise, themes for the win. Yeah, it, it's gonna hurt your <laughs> eyes, I guess. Other than that, I don't think like a real programmer needs to know only one programming language. Yep. So I think you shouldn't have many Fair different enough. tools in your toolkit. Yeah, which yeah. is interesting. So I have I have experience. I did professional Java Spring Boot for a while at, at FedEx, but it's been several years. I haven't touched Java in four years at this point. Oh, wow. So I am like very heavily a JavaScript person. So I, I may be less hireable than I should be. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> do we'll you have, have a diehard thing like any specifics i not really like i do because it's a fun conversation i guess i'm a big like from a css perspective there's like people debate about tailwind versus not i'm a huge tailwind fan so i i use tailwind all the time which does actually like the negative side of that is when i go to write vanilla like regular css i actually have a hard time doing it because I'm thinking in terms of Tailwind classes and less in terms of actual CSS properties. So that's yeah. that's one of the challenges. But I'm a big, big Tailwind fan, big JavaScript fan. Um, just in general, that's obviously where I spend the majority of my time. So Makes sense. Yeah. Right. Um, Brian cool. is uh, listening on uh, Twitch. Brian said he's excited for this chat. I'm curious. I assume this is going to be new for a lot of people, but has anyone seen swim before for I, I phrased it as like a better way to do developer documentation which i think is like seems very true a very innovative way um to do it and i'm excited for everyone to uh to get to see see that sort of stuff so as we go through this if people have questions comments things you want to share uh just add those in the chat i'll make sure to bring them up and use those as talking points um we'll talk about two of my favorite topics in this which is VS Code integrations and AI integrations into like this whole world of developer documentation. So it's like particularly exciting for me. Um, yeah, also Brian, who's in the chat on Twitch, a core part of his job is doing documentation. So he's particularly interested <laughs> from a selfish perspective of maybe this is something that uh, they can incorporate at uh, Planet Scale for his job. But all that said, welcome everyone. Glad to have you all. Again, if you have questions, comments, uh, just leave them in the chat. We're going to talk about swim uh, again tagline is that i came up with better way to do developer documentation for several different reasons that i think are super cool and omar welcome to the stream excited to have you on do you want to tell people just a little bit about yourself your background and then we'll get into like introduction of swim yeah of course so first hi everyone and thank you for having me it's great to be here um omar i live in tel aviv in israel with my wife and one-year-old son um I'm 33 years old, I'm one of the four co-founders of SWIM, I'm the CTO. And in addition to documentation, I also really love coffee, as my shirt suggests. <laughs> um, and also, I'm a big fan of teaching and sharing content and knowledge. So documentation is one way. I also have a YouTube channel dedicated mostly to tutorials about Git internals, computer networks, uh, stuff like that. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you all. Cool. I'm going to put a link to uh, to your YouTube channel in the chat as well so people can find that. Um, the The coffee thing is fun. You promised me if I make it to Tel Aviv that uh, you'll make me some coffee, which I am super excited about. I also meet more and more people slash companies and products that are in Tel Aviv. So it would be like a super fun trip for me to make one day. So one day I will make it there. We'll get to hang out in person. Um, yeah, it would be awesome. It's really concentrated. You have so many companies yeah. in like one kilometer square mm -hmm. square mile <laughs> radius. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, cool. Do you want to do you want to introduce like the idea behind Swim and and maybe touch on like some of the 
problems that it helps solve with documentation for developers? Yes, of course. So I love your tagline. Um, but our usual tagline is a knowledge management tool for code. And basically, as developers, we all know the feeling when we get to code that not we have written ourselves. And it's a hard task to do. And in general, there are two approaches to having someone get into code they don't know. One is throw them to the water, <laughs> and then they either sink or swim, hence the name of the company, Swim. <laughs> oh, and, I didn't think about that. Right. Oh, that's such a good, that's so good. So instead of swink, you're, or uh, swink, instead swink. of sink, <laughs> you are going for Swim as a product. That makes sense. I like it. Thanks. It's uh, one of the co-founders, Gilad, came up with it. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, um, and the so that's one approach, right? Right. And the other approach would be, okay, you have those docs. Go ahead and read them. Mm -hmm. Now, what we found is that almost no one really has those docs. Um, and when we talked with people about that, we realized that documentation and the way it's structured is broken, especially for developers. And one of the main reasons is that documentation is not coupled to the code. So when the code changes, documentation docs might, get outdated yeah. really quickly. Yeah, exactly. And they become the docs become obsolete. So as a developer that reads the docs, I find one thing that's inaccurate, another thing that's misleading, and then okay, I just lose face in the documentation, and I don't bother creating it in the first place. Mm -hmm. We also found out that knowledge tends to be scattered. So you might have some of it only on some people's brains, of course. Um, and even that knowledge that is written somewhere might be in a Slack conversation and then in a Google Doc and then in a page on a wiki or something like that. So you don't even know where to find the docs. So if documentation is outdated and you can't find the knowledge you need when you need it, why bother creating you, it in the first yeah. place, yep. right? We go back to the first... Uh, approach of throwing you to the deep end of the pool, which we know is not the <laughs> ideal way. <laughs> so that's basically why we started Swim. I love that. I'm really curious for people mm -hmm. watching. Does anyone have want to share like an experience of onboarding to a new company slash code base? Because I'm thinking back to when I was onboarding at FedEx, which um, was the only specific like software engineer role that I've had because I've been in developer advocacy roles other than that. But for that, I I don't think there like there was a couple of business documents that I could have looked through and like some really intense like some of that documentation was just like it was strictly business and it was very detailed, not the kind of thing that I would read through. And other than that, I I just remember like going from function call to function call and trying to like read through the code myself without having like an overview of of what it is or like a guide through it. So the idea of tying in like the actual code to documentation makes so much sense. Um, Brady in the chat said a GitHub re readme was my onboarding. I imagine that's very similar to, and there's like read some readmes are good. A lot of them like not so good as well. So that's like how well, how, how much um, intentionality you put in documentation. makes a big, uh, big difference. Um, Brady says that uh, he tries to document in Confluence now. That's a very popular way. You mentioned like wikis, Confluence docs, things in Google Docs. That's one of the challenges is having documentation in a lot of place. Andrew said GitHub readmes in multiple folder locations. Finding the right one, I imagine, is a challenge. Uh, Lauren is, has joined us. What's up, Lauren? Uh, Confluence is where documentation goes to die. All right, I'll... Uh, I'll leave that one for what it is, but I, I laugh at that one. <laughs> Do is there anything else you want to add, just context, or maybe are you comfortable like showing the dashboard to get yeah, started for people to see? We can actually show some of the product, um, the cool. general product first, maybe the web application. So, All right, just full transparency for people that are watching. Yeah, we like talked about this behind the scenes where you had our StreamYard window like on your main monitor, and I was like, "All right, when I when I queue you up, you just move it, and I'll wait for you to finish, <laughs> and then I'll do the transition." And for everybody that's curious, we nailed it because no one had any idea that there yeah. was this extra window. So good job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, but um, you just let everyone know. <laughs> I know, but I we have to brag about ourselves because I think we did Fair a good enough. job. Um, yeah. What well, one additional comment? This actually is is very true for me. Redeem on YouTube mentioned smaller companies using Notion. I know Brian, who's in the chat, who found YouTube, is a huge Notion person. I'm really big into Notion as well, but that's not specifically for 
developer documentation. Like this is it's a specific audience that we're gonna that you're gonna help like address and kind of show people some cool stuff. So great. So okay. So thank you for the intro. And um, I think yeah, we'll just show it. Uh, I think it would be much clearer this way. So this is an example document in Swim that teaches the developer how to add a new command to Git source code. And you can see that it has text um, that is similar to Confluence or Notion or Google Docs and you know, regular text and some headings perhaps. But most interesting, we have code elements. Mm -hmm. Now, one type of those elements is a snippet. So here, for example, you see a few lines from the file add.c. And here you see another line from the file built in dot age, and we can scroll down and see a few other lines with git.c. So basically, it takes you on a tour of the code base. And you mentioned before onboarding to a new code base, trying to go over the function mm -hmm. calls, right? So this takes you through the flow, which is sometimes not exactly clear from the code itself. For example, here you have a definition of a function, but then you need to add a string that corresponds to the name of a part of that function in a totally different place. So it puts everything right next to another and gives you a walkthrough experience, like having the developer who originally wrote this code walk yeah. you through it. That's cool. And one one of the things I know, or two things I noticed, like on the right hand side, table of contents makes sense, like all your headers to navigate through the file, but Really cool thing below that to me is the reference files with links. So with those links, you can go directly to that actual file or it's a pop-up window that shows you the file right here. So you have the context right. for not only the specific context that someone is intentionally trying to provide to you with their message around that specific code block, but then you actually have the code that you can get to quickly as well. Correct. And then you can also ask to show more or less for every specific mm -hmm. snippet. Um, but it should allow you to focus on the most relevant part to understand the flow that this document is trying to explain. That's cool. So as I mentioned, we have different types of elements. Snippet is one, another is a token. So a token is basically any part of a line. So for example, here, CMD add is not just the string CMD add, mm. but rather the token from line 475, which is this one. Oh, this oh can I? Like highlight that? Sorry, I'm like jumping in when I get excited. So yeah, this oh, is, good. it's not yeah. just like an inline markdown, because I do this all the time when I reference a file name or whatever, or a function name, inline, manually type it in with back ticks or whatever, and it kind of highlights itself. This is actually specifically a reference to a token, a string inside of the source code. Correct. And yeah. it could be, well, in this case specifically, it happens to be from the snippet, but it could be from anywhere in this repository mm -hmm. or another repository. That's cool. um, could be a name of a function, name of a variable, a value perhaps, basically any token from the code base. Mm -hmm. And the other type of reference we have is a path. For example, a path of a folder, or it could be that of a file. And again, it's actually a path from within somewhere in the repository. So these kind of documents, as I said, provide some kind of a walkthrough experience of the code, and they're very practical. I know when we talk with many developers, and I'm sure most people can relate to that, we like practical documents, right? We don't like fluff. We want to see how things get done. The problem with these kind of documents is that when the code changes, they become obsolete, which means very, very quickly they're going to become outdated and misleading, right? So to address that in Swim, what we do is we take advantage of the fact that when you write the document, you actually couple your text and explanations to specific locations in the code. And we track the changes introduced to the code base and update the documentation accordingly. So whenever someone issues a pull request with changes, we have a GitHub app that scans those changes and checks if they affected the documents. So for example, mm -hmm. here we reference these files, right? And if no one touched these files, or at least not the relevant locations where the references are taken from, then obviously the document is still up to date. Yep. But if we did change some of these references, then we require further attention. That's cool. So what you see here is basically two things. First, we have a comment, and we show which documents require your attention. I'll click here in a moment. Just another thing to note is that it's also a failed check within the yeah. CI, meaning you can block PR from being merged until all the documents are up to date with the code. This is, this is my reaction right now. 
<laughs> and Brady, Brady and I have the same reaction. That's so cool. Thank you. So just to complete this part of the solution, when I click here, we get to another branch, of course, the branch that we're trying to merge into the main branch or development branch. And then we see for each reference its current state with a code. For example, you can see that all of these references are still up to date. No one touched mm -hmm. this file or maybe another section of the file. Some changes are small changes that we call autosyncable because we autosync them. For example, mm. those two lines that used to reside within a file called git.c, lines 484 to 485, moved to another file called main.c. The line numbers changed a bit. Also, the content changed a bit. The array here was called commands. Now it's called subcommands. But we deem this a rather insignificant change meaning that the description here is still relevant. So here, for example, it says to make it aware of the add command, that is the command we're showing out to add to git. It needs to be registered by adding a CMD struct to the to what used to be commands, now subcommands array. And this is still true. It still holds. Just the small details changed. Now, the thing is that most changes in code are like that. They're small, and they gradually accumulate to the state where the document is so far away from the code that you can't find the reference and then you just yeah. don't know if you can trust the doc or not, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, this is, and there's like more, it, like I think you're using this as the simple use case, but also the logic that you're doing behind the scenes and taking care of is not that simple because you're looking at like moving, moving a line of, or a function from one file to another it doesn't know specifically that's what happened, right? Like your your logic is having to go in to compare, here's something we added in this file, here's something that's similar that we are removed in one file, added in another file. To make that correlation seems like actually a challenge. Like that's really amazing work to be able to pick up on those changes and then have the auto merge or auto merge suggestions or however you want to phrase that for people to come through and just kind of click, um, like manually override or accept. Uh, thank you. Actually, when we <laughs> just started working on that, people told us it would be impossible to keep documentation in line yeah. with code. But I think we found out along the way that when people couple text to specific code elements, we can mm -hmm. track the code elements, which is indeed not trivial. It ended up being the first patent by Swim. And oh, cool. we yeah. changed it a lot since then yep. um, with learning more from you know, working with different clients or repositories. And indeed, it's a, it was a very cool challenge, especially to do that in a way that is language agnostic. So you could document mm, yeah. any file that is textual and stored in Git. That's cool. A random question. Do you write C code these days? Me personally? Yeah. No, not anymore. <laughs> Only when I have to make a patch to Git because they have some bugs sometimes. Okay. But that's a rare occasion. I've never, I've never actually used C. I've you, I did C plus plus and Java in college. So I always say it's my mother's tongue, but I changed uh, along yeah. with with the years and stopped that's using funny. it. Basically, I'm curious. Uh, Killian is in the chat uh, on Twitch, who is an amazing product creator. Created Polypane. If you've ever seen that, it's a browser that has like multiple window like viewports that you can see. They auto sync and it has accessibility tips, all sorts of really amazing stuff. People should go and check out Polypane if you haven't. Um, but he, he said only if I have to writing C. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yep. I can relate to that. Um, all right. So as we saw so far, we have up-to-date elements and we have auto-syncable elements, but sometimes there are changes that are big breaking changes, right? So for example, here, this process of adding a new command to Git used to include this step of adding something into the make file. And say we had someone automate this step, so it's no longer required. So it could be that the make file was deleted, or this mm. line was deleted, or in this case, just to be clear, we changed this line and wrote something else, dif something different swim demo. So in this case, we don't auto-sync it. We mark it as outdated, and we ask the developer mm. that made the change now while the information is fresh in their minds update the documentation accordingly as part of the pull request process. Wow. So we, we have those three verdicts, basically, up-to-date, autosyncable, or 
outdated. Most of the changes we see are out of Singable, which makes it a very fast process to mm -hmm. accept those changes and keep everything up to date. By the way, one pretty cool addition that we made recently, we integrated the open source project Mermaid.js. Are you familiar with that? I've heard of Mermaid, but I don't really know any details about it. So feel free to... Okay, cool. So let's show it. So this is yeah. Mermaid, um, a diagram created by Mermaid. Yeah. And Mermaid provides this textual syntax, which then renders to a diagram. And oh, they have cool. different yeah. diagrams. So we first embedded that as it makes sense to have diagrams when you document your code or processes. And then we figured out we can actually embed tokens from the code to the diagram. So for example, here, you can see that this line says, if run setup in sub commands, it used to be commands, just like before we updated this token. So oh, wow. also the rendered ver version is updated, which- Oh, that's cool. It's really amazing that Merrimi did all of that also and allowed the world to easily create rendered <laughs> images and we said oh we could use that so it was mm -hmm. a really cool integration that's so, cool so it automatically like it automatically updated the diagram because you meaning swim the product automatically updated the code behind the scenes for the diagram and to the point where it's like all connected and visible with in this case this specific case not having to do anything other than come in and approve that right Correct. Exactly. Wow. You could, if you don't like this suggestion, you could right, say, you no, and delete it, do something yeah. else. But most of the time we see people accepting the changes. Wow. Well, you know, what's funny. Like I think about this from a call out perspective for developers. Like you've got infinite things built on top of this, which is the really, really incredible part. But even at a basic level, a tool that is able to look at documentation, look at code and just send you a message to say without even the like smart intelligence that you have on top of it, just to say, Hey, go back and check. This is very useful. I would think like on its own and then to layer on the intelligence of like, you have a, a best guess, a pretty good guess. It looks like of what's changed and how and how to merge it. That's wild on top of like, all the integrations directly into the code with like the tokens and references and lines of code. That's just like, it's a lot. That's really cool. Thanks. I also, we actually found that, as you say, even like product managers, UI UX designers wanted to know when something changes, even though they don't really care about the code itself, but they wanted to know that something in that area changed. Yeah. So some of them actually subscribe to updates whenever a specific mm -hmm. document changes because they just want to know that that part of the code mo was modified. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, question from Killian. He asked, I joined a little later, so you might have done this. Have you explained the duck toggle? I don't, I'm not even sure <laughs> where the duck toggle is. And, and then right, he's because asking, it's not here. It's okay. here if I go to Swim.io. Um, so we call <laughs> this duck mode. Um, and you know we, we are also developers. Oh. <laughs> we love duckies. And most sites have light mode, dark mode yeah. modes. So we have a duck mode. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't have oh, too great. much to say except for that our super, super creative and skillful designer surely made this. <laughs> and I think amazing. it's really cool. We also have like shirts and and yeah, we need like the way small duckies because people can consult with a ducky not only to code but also to document. Right. So it just makes sense. Yep. That's cool. I hope we actually just clarified our. Things. Yeah, absolutely. We we just yeah, referenced sure. this inside of our Discord because someone someone just found out about the idea of rubber ducking of like talking your problem out to a rubber duck and as a developer, and they were like, "Oh, now so many more memes make sense because they understood <laughs> like the context for that." Um, Fair enough. Yeah, that's super so cool. Apparently, uh, this meme is as well. Yes, absolutely. That cool. should be so, definitely um, its meme if, on its own. Sure. So if we go back to the, this part, I think one of the cool things that you get when you couple documentation to code and you keep it up to date is that other things become possible. And before, when you asked about the problems, I mentioned that it's also hard to find documentation when you need it. And I think mm -hmm. it happens, A, because documentation or knowledge is scattered, but B, because developers don't really like changing their content, like, context switching, right? And stop 
working on something and start looking for documentation in case it exists. So the cool thing that keeping documentation up to date enables is actually finding documentation while you work. So this was the first time we introduced documentation into the IDE. So what I'm showing now, I'm gonna actually show it on VS Code. And I'm showing the same project we just saw, Git's source code. Um, everything that I'm showing is also available for JetBrains, by the way. Mm -hmm. So let's see here, say that I'm a developer and I wanna contribute to Git source code. And, and I get to this specific file because I was looking for a way to add a new command and I figured out that I need to change this in some way. And then if I have Swim's plugin installed, I would also see this icon, the waves icon here, and also a lens here telling me that this is actually part of a document. So mm -hmm. if someone referenced these lines in a document, the document is called adding a command and you have some more information about the specific comment that was associated with this snippet. And if I click here, it's actually gonna let me zoom out a bit so you can see everything. It's going to open the document right from the IDE. So I can see everything I just saw on the web, but within my IDE, within VS Code. Super cool. And a couple and of clarifications. Is, yeah, sorry. So yeah, sorry. Please. So that opened up a markdown file. And just to reiterate, which I think you already said, this is embedded documentation and this is how it's tied into your source code, like the the merge or like pull request idea that we just saw in the in the browser. Because these are actually like markdown files in your source code. Um, also want to highlight a comment from Brady that this would have helped so much with a external agency building a theme for a website. It's like a black hole right now. Yes, I I would imagine this would be uh, super helpful for that. And the last thing I wanted to mention is if you go back and just kind of hover again on that swim icon, I think yeah. a really important takeaway for me, one of the things that would have been bad is if I'm a developer, I have the plugin installed, I'm writing code and the UI for swim was distracting. That would be really annoying. Like if it was like big link here of like document, like that's not the stuff I need when I'm doing developer work. So I really like that. It's like little call out here. You can go and get the details that you need by like hovering and, and going to the doc if you want. But as a developer, just writing code, it's not distracting while you're doing that. And it's always, I think a fine line between being unnoticeable almost yeah. and being annoying for developers yep. so indeed it's always something to iterate on i think, um, it's, a, I think it's a good balance yeah thank you and then you managed correct uh, as you mentioned correctly it is indeed a markdown file within the swm folder of the repository and it is a valid markdown file it renders on github or vs code natively but with the plugin you can also see additional information so if i mm -hmm. click on add here you can see it's token add from line wow. 485 for example really so cool. thank you and also if let's say if i go back to the scenario where i'm a developer i just realized there is a document here that can help me and then i say oh i should have probably gone to built-in.h before to see this part if i click here Swim on the yeah. left-hand side would open this specific snippet so I can go back and forth, right? I can read the doc and see the code one next to another. So I don't need to context switch. I don't need to open another browser, say, okay. um, to look at the documentation there. And I imagine, like, so one, this functionality, this extension was officially launched this week. Is that right? Correct. Um, oh. more, most importantly, to... I think they haven't yet shown or okay. launched this week because we th this capability of being able to see that the relevant document exists and clicking here has existed for a while. Mm -hmm. um, there are more things, but cool. I'll let you finish first. Yes, that's fair enough. But I was going to say, like, I imagine this was part of the original longer term vision. So, like, you originally showed the dashboard, you showed something similar where you could go from link in the documentation to open the pop up with the source code. And that is very nice to have. I think it's an essential thing to have. But as a developer, if you don't have integrations for a product in the environment that you're using to write the code with VS Code or IntelliJ or JetBrains or JetBrains IntelliJ, is that right? Or what? Uh, not IntelliJ is one. What, is it a specific Correct. JetBrains product or is it all JetBrains? No, we support products? all JetBrains products, okay. uh, um, at cool. least the existing ones. <laughs> yes, fair enough. And they've got several different ones. 
But like if you're building developer tools and they don't integrate into the actual IDE that those developers are using, it seems like a big missed opportunity. Um, so I imagine like this was part of the vision probably very early on. And it's really cool to see this kind of come to fruition now, including the two things that you hadn't mentioned yet that you <laughs> wanted to do next. <laughs> right. So indeed, it was part of the vision. And I can say that we always had the balance between keep iterating on one product, for example, the web mm -hmm. application with the yep. dashboard and the editor that you saw and making it better and better, for example, adding Mermaid there mm -hmm. versus supporting multiple different yep. platforms, web application and JetBrains and VS Code and maybe other IDs as well. So and then we chose to focus first on the web editor and the web application as a whole, and then embed everything into the IDE. So as I mentioned, this specific functionality has existed for a while. The two new cool things is A, now we actually sync the documentation with the code live on the IDE. So say I go here and let's, um, I know, let's, add a few new lines here, for example. So you'll also see that this automatically moves with me, right, the icon. But also if I add something, so let's change it from add to add for. For example, and I click here again, then you can see verifying running, that is Swim is verifying that the document is still up to date. In this case, it's not. It updated add to add for, can accept, and also the snippet changed, obviously. That's cool. So the line number is different. Yeah. You can do everything from the IDE. And one of the things we realized before launching this is our users would tell us, okay, but why do I need to push my code and then get notified that I need to change the document and then open your web application to change it? I mean, it's cool that it helps me in the CI make sure I did that, but why is that the default? I want to make the change to the document as I'm changing the code. And we said, right, but then back to this balance between improving and iterating on one product versus going into other platforms as well, if that yep. makes sense. Absolutely. I'm going to, I'm going to take a quick pause because we just had a raid from our friend, Jason Langsdorf on uh, Twitch. So we've got a bunch of people that just joined the stream. Jason, uh, welcome. Thanks for bringing everyone over. Hope your stream went well. Great to, I say, see you, but it's like in where you can chat and I can talk, but anyway, we had a lot of people join. Welcome, everyone. We are talking about swim.io. Uh, Let me get the link to just put in here for reference. And Om Omer is showing the VS Code integration for this and some amazing features. Just for everyone that just joined, do you want to give like the two cents or like however long, quick overview of swim and then kind of relate back to what we're showing inside of VS Code? Of course. Ah, sorry, of course. So hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, so in a nutshell, we're a knowledge management tool for code, and we help developers share knowledge about their code and manage their knowledge about the code. And it's, th our solution has a few aspects. One is providing you with a way to create documents that actually stay up to date when the code changes. And this is something I'm going to show again in a sec to make sure it's clear. The other is to have a great experience creating documentation. And third, finding documentation when you need it most. So if I jump back to the last thing we showed, or the previous thing we showed, the head tilde one, if you want in Git syntax. <laughs> yeah. uh, so if I go to this file now, and I'm a developer, I don't even know this document exists, but I got to this file while observing the code, while exploring the code, I can notice Swim's icon here, and this small message telling me that this is actually referenced in a document. If I click here, the document would open on the right-hand side, and I can see the document alongside the code. And this way, I can find documentation integrated into my workflow seamlessly without needing to context switch or to start searching for knowledge that I might need. So we showed that. And before, we had also showed the web application. And we finished with showing that we can actually keep this up to date. So for example, we changed this from Ed4 from Ed to Ed4. And now uh, maybe let's change it again to Ed7, just for the example. And if I click here, you'll notice that it is verifying that everything is up to date. In this case, it's not. So we updated the token from the documentation from Ed4 to Ed7. And also the snippet here. Before we showed a bit more advanced example where 
the entire snippet moved to another file and a few other changes were introduced. Um, but the basic thing is that by tracking those elements of code that you reference in the documents, we were able to keep the documents up to date with the code as it evolves. It's so cool. This is like, I don't know, we'll, we're kind of seeing these individual pieces show up again and again, but the relationship between code and documentation, the linking between the two, the referencing between the two, which enables not only like quick navigation that we've seen a couple of times, but also this tie in where you can do automatic checking to see if like the documentation that we've already created that refers to specific tokens, which is just like a, a string token or like function name or whatever you want it to be, specific lines of code, et cetera, those relationships now enable as you change the code to then do verification to say, is the documentation still up to date? which is before then adding on these additional features of making then suggestions based on that of like, Hey, here's what we think it should be. Now you can approve this. And I clarified this earlier, but this is documentation that you have tool tooling around from a UI perspective to generate, to view, to relay back to code, but then also is embedded in your source code. So you have, um, you have everything right here, have the extension of VS code to go back and forth to do whatever you want or view whatever you want at any time. Correct. So that's a very accurate overview. Cool. <laughs> nice job, James. <laughs> I'm working so, I'm working on my sales pitch so I can do your next commercial. Well done. <laughs> um, Tech Riley said that he's a big fan. Much better to write code and documentation at the same time while your memory is fresh. And I mentioned this earlier, just your ability to notify people, like regardless of your other amazing things on top of this, just the ability to notify people that there is a, a specific line of code that's changed that you probably want to update your documentation for. That by itself is super huge. Um, I think I have the answer to this question, but I, I want to be sure. So I'll let you answer. But a question from Nibby, uh, who tuned in. Um, is this a SaaS product or also open source? Like, Meaning, I'm assuming the question would be like, can I go and run this somewhere on my own server? So the it, it is SaaS. And you can run this on your own server, as in we have the IDE plugin that you can run. Um, and you could work locally to some extent, but some of the functionality requires uh, connectivity with Swim servers. Cool. Yep, totally makes sense. Cool. So if I circle back for a sec, I said there are two more things that we released uh, last week, um, <laughs> or this week, actually. So one is keeping things up to date from the IDE. And the last one seems almost obvious or something that you would expect to have, but it does take time and effort to make sure it works well in the IDE. And for me personally, it really changed how I work with Wim. And this is the ability to create documentation from the IDE. So what you see on the right-hand side is actually in edit mode. So I could obviously write some text mm -hmm. and it has markdown by the way. So if you're, if you're like writing in markdown, so it would change to a heading, for example. Um, we also support UI for developers who prefer doing things this way, but as you like. Did and you, then if I real quick question, just um, as a aspiring entrepreneur or product builder, did you build like that editor experience yourself? Do you know from scratch? So yes and no. Okay. The from scratch, I, I guess no one build things. <laughs> completely from scratch now, right? You always rely on all kinds of Something, libraries, yeah. but we have worked a lot and I say we, but the editor is not me. It's <laughs> a lot of really, really great people on my team uh, that worked a lot to create this. So some of the things we could borrow from other projects like text editing, but what I'm gonna show in a minute that it's all the capabilities of linking to code is a, an experience we had to envision ourselves. Yeah. So to show an example, if I use slash now and we get the different commands, so you may see also the commands that are like styling commands, like heading, bullet list, and so on, and YouTube diagrams like mermaid diagram I showed before. And Giphy. And, and Giphy. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm so glad honestly, that's part of it. <laughs> one of the first clients I think we had said, this is a, a game stopper for us. I mean, if you guys implement Giphy, we're gonna buy the product. If not, then not. So yeah, we that was Giphy. their like, <laughs> their that was their breaking point was whether or not you had Giphy involved. True story. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thanks to them, okay. we have Giphy. It's an important feature. Um, That's hilarious. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so the for example to to add an a code snippet from here, 
if I hit enter here, you'll notice that I can select code from the left-hand side and the right-hand side is changing accordingly. So let's say I want to talk about these lines. So I'm going to add them to doc. And now they're added here. Of course, it's going to remain up to date from now on. And I can also add, so let me do this so you guys will see. Um, so let's say I want to talk about uh, notice the, and I'm using a backtick here. I'm using CMD blame. And you can see I get autocomplete suggestions by swim, similar to what your idea would do while you're coding. And here we are saying you probably want to couple to this specific occurrence of CMD blame. But that's um, like, but I feel like that's better than regular VS code and telesense. I, because it's not like you're doing a full, because it's not like you're necessarily typing in the function name. Like you're getting IntelliSense for like any string. Correct. So if you want to notice the, let's say run setup flag, right? And this is not a function right. name. And you can get the different occurrences. So it shows you line 497, 9498. In this case, it doesn't really matter maybe for the documentation, but sometimes we want a specific occurrence. Mm -hmm. So when I select it, I'm going to couple to this specific occurrence. Wow. And what's also cool now that since I can do it from VS Code, let's say I'm following a specific flow and I want to get to where this function is actually implemented or defined or get from one for go to definition, all of the things that as developers we're used to doing, right? I can do that and use VS Code's capabilities and the way I'm used working mm -hmm. with code. And then I can just, let's say I found this part now. So I'll go back here and I'll use slash code snippet again. Wow. I can select these lines and keep on working. So we found out that for people working this way, it's much quicker to create documentation. And I would also say that we found out that it helps a lot with the number one problem in creating documentation, in my opinion, which is the scariest screen of all, a blank page. <laughs> Right, so if, just the getting started part. Right, so if I go to Swim's plugin now and, and let me hit create here, so I zoom that in a bit, so everyone can let me change it. So if I use create now, I'm gonna get a blank page, right? And this is scary, but the cool thing is that instead of starting from thinking, okay, how should I structure my document? What should I explain first? What I can do is actually start from code. So say I want to explain how to add a new command. I would just start adding snippets that show how I added the last command I added. So if it was CMD add, we did before, I would select this snippet. And then I would go ahead and select this snippet. And I don't need to think about how to structure mm -hmm. a document. Rather, I think about the code. And now I, the canvas can is no backwards. longer blank. Yeah. Right? Yeah, of course. I can I change. Do... The order I do this a lot different. with, um, sorry, I do this a lot with blog posts yeah. as well. Like if I don't know where to start, I usually am doing a blog post from an existing video. So I start to just copy in like, what are the obvious elements from the video that I'm going to have and then figure out the wording and the flow and that sort of stuff. But having, having those starting points, like you're saying, is definitely really beneficial when you're creating something from scratch. Right. And also we found that when people do that, it's easier for them to understand the flow of the document. And also they mm -hmm. save some words because you don't need to explain the specific Everything. lines yeah. as in, yeah, exactly. Like I, I assume that someone who reads this document knows C to an extent. Mm -hmm. So I don't need to explain what a struct is or the fact that it's a struct, but I would need to explain why I'm adding things here. And you mentioned before that when you got into a new code, you spent some time walking through the function call change, mm -hmm. I would say, right? Um, which is something that everyone does and it's important. <laughs> But some things are just not deducible from the code, right? Like the business logic, why we did something in a certain way, why we didn't implement something in a way that obviously doesn't exist because it hasn't been implemented. So we encourage people to describe those things mostly and the relationship between different parts of the code rather than explain, okay, here I define the function, CMD add, it returns an integer. I mean, I can read code, thank you. Give me the bigger picture. So oh, cool. I'm curious, like this is, an aside, but for people in the chat watching, how many people have used C ever and then have done it like in the last couple of years? Because it's still not something I have done. So I, you would actually, I would be one of those people that you'd have to explain what a struct was. 
<laughs> but that's a separate conversation. Yeah, that's right. I still, well, C still has a warm part in my heart, mm -hmm. but indeed, I, I wouldn't try it in C. No. <laughs> <laughs> Brian on YouTube says, nope, never written in C. But see, it's still like when I was at FedEx, C was still, we were trying to move away from C when we could, but there was performance requirements for some of our applications where C was just definitively faster than Java. And so that in that case, sense. like we, we had to do stuff in C because it was really time intensive tasks that had to be done in the, in the like millisecond range. Um, yeah. Right. So it's still, Something. still obviously has its value. Right, it's another tool in the toolbox, I guess, and sometimes it's the right mm -hmm. tool for the job. Yep. Uh, Killian said, "A struct is one of those code thingies in the language." <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. That that makes sense. Yeah, that's a nice definition. I know. Uh, Pedulous or P E Dulous uh, on YouTube says, "I use C plus plus daily. Still haven't found anything that would be faster and more efficient after after decades of using it." Yeah, there's, I think, definitively like performance and or performance benefits that come with it assuming you know how to do memory management because you have to do both of those manually or but you have to do that manually with both c++ and c i believe yeah you used to but newer versions of c++ become more and more like python i would say so okay. they yeah. abstract away some of the things for you yeah um question in the chat from tech rally are there any plans to expand outside of github so i'm actually curious tech rally you may have to clarify that or may does this question make sense to you yeah, it, it definitely makes sense, and it's a okay. great question. So cool. when so for everyone who joined uh, a bit later, I would show that beforehand I, I showed our web application interface, right? Mm -hmm. And here, everything was working with GitHub's API. That is, if I wanted to add a snippet, so it would be the oh, same as before. Right. Okay. Just slash snippet, and now I would fetch the actual code from GitHub. By the way, as part of our security policy, we never store code or documents of our users. So every okay. time I fetch code now, it goes from my browser to GitHub directly. So yeah, makes sense. here's a, I would select something. So I'd go here. So all of that is coming code. directly from GitHub. So now, exactly. that, now the question totally makes sense, yeah. Yeah. So. Indeed, we do have plans supporting more Git hosting platforms, specifically GitLab and Bitbucket, mm -hmm. very soon. I would also say that it is possible to start from the IDE you now. So if I have VS Code and I have the Git repository locally cloned, I could start directly from VS Code. Not everything that is possible from the web application is already implemented in the IDE. One example is a playlist. Uh, which is a sequence of documents one after the other. So you mentioned onboarding to a new project. So a very common way to do that in Swim is actually show you a list of things you want to go through. So oh, the first, yeah. this example, this is from our internal um, documentation. So whenever someone joins the front-end part of Swim, so they go through this document first, explaining the overall structure. So this document is pretty high level, right? It doesn't have snippets. It does have paths in case these ever change. And then we have documents describing the main flows, how to data is being fetched from the database to the store. And we have some That's documents cool. describing how we run tests. So this, for example, is not yet a part of the IDE experience or the ability to add snippets from multiple repositories. So I mentioned before that you could have elements from different repos. So again, if mm. you use slash okay. snippet here, so with GitHub, obviously, I have access to multiple GitHub repositories that I added to my Swim workspace, so I could go to any other. And reference those, yeah. Exactly. Now, within the IDE, I'm in one, specifically now, I'm in one repository, right? And it is possible, but a bit weird experience, yeah. I guess, to reference something from another um, repo, yeah. so it's not yet Fair supported. Enough. Yeah. That makes sense. So, so back to the question, you could start working from the IDE, VS Code or JetBrains. Mm -hmm. If you don't have GitHub, notice that some things are still coming into the IDE gradually. Yep. Maybe, um, again, like separate side question for people watching. Favorite editor? Are people using JetBrains IDEs? A lot of people, I've seen a few people like do videos on YouTube and switching from VS Code to WebStorm, which is... I believe a paid product or at least features of it are paid. So there's like a difference there. 
Uh, but I'm curious. And then there's lots of like, I don't know if purist is the right word, but like Vim users or NeoVim or something like that. So I'd be curious to to see what people think about their favorite text editors. And then going back to the memory management stuff, um, PE Doulis said, uh, memory management too important to leave up to the machine uh, versus too important to leave it up to humans. Not yet. Uh, yeah, very, very fun. The The take there is like, it doesn't matter until it does, right? Like most applications, it probably doesn't matter. But then you get to the point where we were with the stuff we were working on at FedEx and it like really, really mattered to the point where they couldn't, for those specific applications, move away from uh, the control and speed that they had in C. So anyway. Yeah, that makes sense. I would say that we do not support on supporting Vim as a plugin yeah. to Vim in the upcoming future. <laughs> There, it is like surprising to me how many people love and still use them because you can be like you can be very productive if you get really good at it. But it, I think that learning curve is still so steep that it is a, a relatively small percentage of people that do that. Right. I think nowadays you can actually easily configure VS Code to work with mm -hmm. all the keyboard shortcuts you're used yep. to from Vim. So I don't really see an advantage to using Vim rather than VS Code. But I guess it's a personal preference after all. Oh. Oh. I meant to ask this earlier, but just out of curiosity, how big is Swim? Like, how many employees do you have? So I, if I'm not mistaken, today we're 42 okay. uh, employees. Yeah. That's exciting. Based, yeah. based in Tel Aviv, we have currently one engineer in New York. And ah, sorry, one solution engineer in New York. We have a new mm -hmm. office in New York now with a few people. Cool. And we have one engineer in Berlin. And one engineer in the Yorkshire area in London, in, uh, in north of London, in England. Okay. Yeah. Cool. That's exciting. That's an exciting stage to be in as a company. Do you, um, again, like another per more personal question? Do you do or personal interest of mine, not a personal question about you? Do, <laughs> have you have you been at like uh, at conferences, like with a like sponsoring conferences or just like speaking at conferences to help like kind of raise awareness for the product? Yeah, so um, first of all, I think you and I attended uh, oh, right. the yeah, same yeah. conference once, yeah, right? Fair enough. Uh, yeah, and I believe you covered it also on your channel. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that was that more in front <laughs> end. Uh, we also went to Lead Dev in uh, New York recently. We're cool. going to be in Lead Dev in London next month. Okay. Um, uh, basically, we love conferences for developers and also for engineering managers or staff engineers that want mm -hmm. to make sure development processes are as effective as possible. Yep. Makes sense. That's exciting. Well, maybe we'll catch up at an in-person event sometime soon. Yeah, hopefully. Um, also, Pedula said, still using Vim. Seems I'm getting old. <laughs> Not at all. Like, whatever works for you <laughs> is, uh, is... I would say I always thing. admire people who stick yes. to Vim, right? Same. It's yes. super um, impressive. Same, for absolutely. Sure. Yep. Um, so there, there was kind of two two segments to what we we're gonna well i guess three segments so we, we talked about like the the dashboard and the browser that we started with then we got into the vs code integrations and then the last part is ai features and there's like all these memes going around i haven't i haven't actually watched one but like um google io is this week or yesterday or whatever and they're like apparently they mentioned ai like a hundred times and that's kind of the trend of 2023 so is that, is that like a path? I, the answer is yes, because I already know this. But do you want to tell us about like AI integrations into Swim? <laughs> uh, sure, definitely. I, I think in general, we live in an exciting time, right? It's super cool to see lots of things. And I think AI, generative AI, large language models are going to be a really cool new tool in the toolbox for everything. And we still need to see uh, the way to see where things actually go and how it affects everything. For Swim, I would say that some things are still a surprise, but I can provide a sneak peek of some of the things we have in the oven and maybe explain some things that we plan on adding, if that's okay. Absolutely, so, yeah. Let me show another uh, repository for a second. So this would be very similar to what we saw now. It's from another code base, Swim's code base. And we have here some code that parses CLI commands and now when I use slash here, as I did before, if you remember the first command was um, snippet or within the snippet comment, it was smart token. And now we have generate description. 
What it basically does is uses AI to generate a textual description of this snippet, which means the process I showed before saying take snippets first and then describe them and the connection between them can become much easier in some cases where you do want to explain what's happening here by using AI to generate the description mm -hmm. of this snippet. So this is the first thing we're going to release actually related to AI coming up soon. And the next stages are going to be things that help you create documents in general. So some of the things are going to be like create an introduction or just take this document, make it better. I know many people who whose native language is not English usually feel a bit uncomfortable writing documents in mm -hmm. English. Yeah. And then I heard from a lot of them that they just copy their documents to ChatGPT, for say, and then get a better version. Or yeah. some someone even told me I'm using Israeli English and I get out American English. It's cool. So mm. I don't know if that's the scientific term for that, uh, but I think <laughs> everyone could uh, use such tools to enhance their language. Um, so this is one other thing. The a bit more, I guess, groundbreaking things are combinations that we're working on of static analysis capabilities and other things that we have with Swing together with AI to generate really cool things. Um, but that is that will come up in a few weeks, I hope. <laughs> so you'll have to wait a bit longer. Fair enough. Yeah. Maybe we'll do like an updated update version of the stream at that point when you have more to show. It seems yeah. like it seems like this is I don't know, like there, there's these fads in tech and I like, I looked at like, for me, I wasn't interested in, in web three. I've never been really into crypto. I've never really been into, um, virtual reality type stuff. Like I remember working at Microsoft when the HoloLens was being worked on eight, nine years ago, like a long time ago and, and them selling HoloLens, like it was going to change the world. And it just hasn't like it. like, I'm sure it's being used somewhere, but it was just one of those things that j it didn't feel super tangible because it didn't feel like it made sense on an everyday basis yet. For me, AI has just made sense. Like immediately I've seen a use case for myself. Like I use chat GPT almost on a daily basis to get inspiration, to help me generate code, like whatever it is, I use it almost on a daily basis. And it feels like for so many products, like if you're not already considering how you're going to include it into your product, you're like already behind, which maybe that's a little dramatic, but like everyone is finding a way to incorporate it into their products. And it seems like if you're, if you're not already looking at it, you're behind. Right. I think you're exactly right. And I think some parts of AI integration are already expected. I mean, people expect you to have yeah. some integration to help them do things with AI. And if they feel like they need to copy something from your product into ChatGPT and go back, you've done a lousy job because you should have mm -hmm. integrated that, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think the interesting part comes when people integrate AI into more subtle parts of the product or in a more innovative way, like feeding AI with something that the product itself understands about, say, the code for this example. Um, but anyway, I totally agree. It's completely usable and applicable to so many different use cases. What I think is still early to say is all of those you know, bombastic titles, like they're not gonna be developers in 10 year time or these kind of things. I think we should still wait before we make such bold statements. No, fair enough. Um, there's, a, there's a question in the chat that like is a little personal for me because I feel like as developers, we are silly in how we ask these questions sometimes. So anyway, the question is, why would someone pay for this versus using open source things that do something similar? And to me, that's like, that's not the question. The question is, why should you pay for this? And that's for all the all the different reasons that you've highlighted, including there's a free tier. So that's like one important thing I think to call out for people is there's a free tier. There's also a pay tier, just like every other product that we use on a regular basis. The fact that there are other open source alternatives, that's great. I have, I've never seen anything do all the things that we're looking at here. So I've had, like I've shown other products on stream and on videos before, and people have had similar comments and questions. The reality is like, I definitively see differences in all the things that you've shown and I'll like defend this for now, but there, there is a unique set of functionality and integrations and things that are in this product that I just haven't seen anywhere else. And I think other people have commented like, 
similar thoughts so far in the stream in a very positive way of like, these are some things that are really, really great. So if you have open source alternatives that do the things that you need and there's nothing that stands out to you, like, that's great. Absolutely do that. Um, but I think lots of amazing stuff here that would absolutely be worth paying for in addition to the fact that there is also an existing free tier. Uh, and then Brian commented, saving time is worth money. Absolutely. Yeah, thank and you for that. I like agree. Said, this and, has uh, been like a personal uh, rant of mine recently <laughs> after, because I, I published, it was actually, um, I don't know if, if Killing is still here, but I published a video like highlighting his product. It wasn't, he didn't pay me to do it, do it. He didn't ask me to, it was just an awesome product and I wanted to share it. And people were leaving comment after comment. Why would people pay for something that's built on top of open source? thinking like implying that we're not supposed to use open source to build paid products, which is what is done every day. Anyway, that's like my personal rant of the day. Yeah, I, I agree with everything it said. I would also say that we love open source and we mm -hmm. contribute to open source and open source projects can use swim for free. And we're nice. happy to contribute to the open source community. And I hope we have even tighter connections with the open source community in the future. Um, but at least personally, I also don't know other tools that provide yep. the capabilities that we do. Yeah, absolutely. That's It's been a really cool thing to see also from other products, their focus on supporting the open source ecosystem. It seems like that is a much more common, a more and more common thing as people are building products for open source to be a focus of what they do. One that comes to mind in particular is um, AppRight. And they started, right. it's a back end as a service. I think they are they based in Israel as well? I think they I are. I believe so, yeah. Yeah. Um, again, going back to like how many amazing companies there are there. But they created an open source fund. They've talked about open source. I think Eldad, who is the founder, is like really just always been a big open source person. So that is fun to see like as people are building products, also recognizing the impact, not only that open source has had like on the things that they're able to build, but also just the community as a whole and being able to support that in different ways. Right. I think it's really cool. And it, you know, we are part of the open source community. Mm -hmm. The only question is whether you are an active participant or a passive participant, right? Because you're going to use open source Absolutely. this way or another. We all use Git, right? On a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So you, we use open source. Uh, another cool company that comes to mind in that is SNCC, by the way, that also oh, yeah. Yeah. in the open source sphere and still doing does a lot in the open source sphere. Um, also based in Israel in Tel Aviv. That's cool. <laughs> I it just so like, happens. <laughs> I know. I, so that'll be really cool for me the day that I get to to make it to Tel Aviv because I'll get to meet 50 different companies that I know of. <laughs> I'll give you a tour. Place. It's all really close. It's, <laughs> it's a short tour, but it's a cool one. That is cool. Um, another question in the chat. Do you have an integration to Obsidian or plan to do one? And maybe like maybe a more generic question to consider too is like there's obsidian there's notion there's other tools that are made for documentation to a certain extent not necessarily specific developer documentation but any thoughts on integrating with other services like obsidian notion etc yeah so we have thoughts for sure and we keep considering that every now and then i will say that we do it with some of our clients so we build an integration for them we found out that different companies prefer different styles of integrations mm -hmm. so even if two different companies use notion they have different expectations How from they such want integration it. yeah yeah where the single source of truth would be should the document be editable on notion or only consumed do they want the mm. code snippets to be on notion or not necessarily because there is sensitive information there so it turns to be a subtle question every time um so we kind of tailor makes things for a specific client when it comes to integrating with other documentation tools and then maybe like maybe if you get enough of those over time and you start to see the commonalities maybe it makes sense to have a more formal dedicated integration uh, but i could i could absolutely see very different opinions on on how those integrations would work and that being a challenge to make like one thing to fit everyone that might be interested right i can say that some of those tools are actually relying heavily on markdown and then it's pretty straightforward because mm. our documents are also marked on files that are yep. valid markdowns. So with Backstage, for example, which is also open source, you can run Backstage even on your own machine. 
you could use it to display swim documents out of the box basically cool yeah that makes sense in in the last couple of minutes uh any last minute questions from the chat uh just go ahead and put those in there we'll get those asked any last thoughts for for you to share with people that are watching um yeah i think first of all thank you all for joining us and watching it's so great to share something that you and your team have yeah. built for so long with the world it's really exciting um and i want to say we all have our notion about documentation and we have had bad experiences usually with documentation because as i said in the beginning documentation is broken but we now have new tools that allow us to keep documents up to date and to find them while we're working and to write them within the idea when everything is fresh and it's easy to create them and soon enough if we talk about integrating ai into that so maybe helping us with the writing text per se so i think documentation deserves a new chance and another look <laughs> with fresh eyes if that makes sense love it i think that reminds me of um so i worked for planet scale brian in the chat works for planet scale and i've done some work uh with zeta another database company that's doing really innovative things and that that also reminds me of the idea of databases like databases just didn't change in a beneficial way for developers for years and and right. it seems like now we're seeing like all right this this process this integration of databases into development process deserves to be better and i see people like really making that a focus and doing some innovative things at these different companies so similar it just felt similar to how you described like the state of documentation now and hopefully what the future will be right i think it happens every few years to another aspect of development mm -hmm. it would be tests right and then it's even more neat it's like so end-to-end -end tests we need to reinvent that and then feature flags it's so hard everyone needs to reinvent the wheel and then you have a few companies that help with it right so yep. I think now it's a good time for documentation. Absolutely. Uh, maybe last question um, about GDPR and SOC 2, type 2 compliant. I'm not, I don't actually know what that uh, last yeah, one is. Yeah, these are uh, compliances. Uh, yep. We are compliant. Uh, we have SOC 2 compliance and also ISO compliance. Okay. Um, GDPR, I'm not sure what state we're in exactly, but feel free to ping me afterwards and I'll make sure to validate that. Cool. And that's actually how since you don't store any of the documentation yourself how does that factor in or is that the answer is like because you don't store it <laughs> well um it, it's not exactly the answer because <laughs> SOC2, for example makes sure that we as a company have lots of processes and for example that every mm. code that goes into production goes through someone reviewing it and okay. we have some other things we have to make sure we take care of um so we have that but it does help companies when they ask all of the um, relevant questions. For example, do you store the code? Do you store the docs? Do you have access to things? So we say we only process things that we need while we need them, we never store them. So that's mm -hmm. very helpful with uh, security processes, I would say, by different yep. companies. But yeah, compliance is another thing, and sometimes it's also required. Fair enough, yeah. Th that's one of infinite challenges that come with building a product because as a developer like i always talk about i have the ability to build a product and solve problems for people and that's great and then like there's the potential to turn that into a bigger product and like a company and all these things but you get to a certain point where you're responsible for every aspect of running a business including legal including market including all the things um so yeah it is I imagine including the coffee though. That's a really the coffee. good point. Someone, about it, right? someone has to do the coffee, and so yeah, there's all these different barista, aspects. Right? That's right. <laughs> that you have to be on on top of. Exactly. <laughs> Especially the coffee. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Um, I think for people on Twitch, I am going to raid you over to Bald Bearded. He makes it a challenge to say his name. I'll read you over to Bald Bearded Builder. Uh, for everybody on YouTube, this will be it. The video will be live on YouTube long term, so you can find it under the live tab if you want to come back and watch and reference things. In the meantime, though, thank you for joining. I really appreciate it. Thanks for showing everybody the amazingness that you have to offer. Hopefully, everyone enjoyed it, and we'll catch you all next time. Thank you so much for having me.